Welcome to Ask the Java Architects, DevOps 2018 edition. Uh, I'm Mark Reinhold. I'm joined by several of my colleagues who will introduce themselves in a moment. Uh, we are here to um, answer questions. Let's skip that. Uh, I will do show that this is, this is the shortest slide deck I ever use. You already know this. Don't believe anything we say. Uh, so this is Q&A. Uh, we have, we have two, two, two people have graciously agreed to run the microphone, so microphones will run around the room. Please do not shout out your questions, uh, because if we have to repeat them, we'll probably get them wrong, and it also takes more time. Please wait for a mic, and please don't hog the mic. Uh, for all you people out there in the dark, uh, you can ask questions on Twitter with this hashtag, or if you're in the room and you're just shy, that's okay, you can ask a question uh, via Twitter on this hashtag. I'll be looking at that in real time and, and picking some questions from there as well. So, with that introductions, I'm Mark. Brian Getz. Stuart Marks, also known as Dr. Deprecator. <laughs> Mauricio Chimadamora, I work on the compiler. Alan Bateman, I mostly work in the uh, libraries area and in Project Loom at the moment. And I am Eric Uslan, working in a GC team on ZGC. Okay, the floor is yours. Hi. So at some point in time, I think it was around Java 7, uh, you decided to move um, class file verification out of the runtime into the compiler, talking about the stack map table and stuff. What was the justifica or justification for that? Like, Are there things you can do in the compiler that you can't do in the runtime, for example? Yeah, go, go, Alan, go. Yeah. We all know the answer. We all know the answer. <laughs> I'm actually wondering what the motivation for this uh, question is. is <laughs> <laughs> are we still having problems generating stat maps? <laughs> it, it, the, origi the original motivation was, 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 was performance and startup. Um, um, so that's how we ended up with uh, the, 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 both a, a type checking and a type inference verifier. And um, I th suspect when you're talking about six to seven, you're talking about there was a fallback existing code continued to work, and then in seven the, fall, the spec was changed to disallow the fallback, and then a lot of existing code that was generating class files without stack maps broke. Is that what you're asking about? Okay. Uh, that's the story. <laughs> and, do, and there's a glass half full, half empty thing, right? That, you know, so for a long time we had both, and the, uh, the type inferencing verifier was the fallback for those who hadn't quite gotten with the message. And they were the period, uh, how long was it, like six years that we had both running? Yep. It was quite a long period of time. And so it wasn't like one day we just pulled the carpet out from under everybody. There was six years of warning or you know, s s something like that. And then eventually we turned off the type inferencing verifier as we said we would. Um, and as, as Alan said, the main, the main reason was improved startup time. Good morning. Hello. Um, the, the hotspot compiler or the hotspot runtime does optimizations when the application runs long and most often after something has been uh, executed over 10,000 times. But with current cloud deployments, you know, s applications don't live that long anymore. Would there be a way in the future maybe that uh, those optimizations uh, would be possible to take into a next startup or so that a new startup because the changes are really small often so any optimizations that the compiler would have been done would probably be uh, able to use that for the next startup also right so I think I can answer that question and uh, I've talked to Joy about this and as you say, it's a bit silly we're derping around in the interpreter every time when we start. And we learn the, things, the same things every time. And we have that same de-optimization when we do the hash code on the M2 string. And there is something we can learn from that. And talk to Joy about this. And he has a P3 enhancement to basically take the logs from the compilers and the metadata and stick that into the CDS archive so that uh, the next time we start running, we can start jitting straight away before getting the evidence from the interpreter that is worthwhile doing it as a speculative optimization. So yeah, there are eyes being spent looking on that. 
And, and, and this is part of a sort of bigger, bigger program of uh, startup optimization. So we've had class data sharing for a long time. Um, we've recently open sourced the application class data sharing to make the class data sharing mechanism available to applications. We have an experimental AOT compiler. Uh, so there are a lot of different aspects of startup that have been being worked on over the last 10 years that if you if you're in a situation where you prefer startup time to uh, to peak performance, you can um, you know you, you can take the take the hit of a more complicated build and um, you know uh, and, and a larger executable and uh, and get that improved startup time. So there's there's a lot of things you can do, but you have to do some of the work that you have to build your application using application class data sharing using AOT in order to get the benefit. So what, here, what, oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say, uh, is um, Google for uh, Matthew Gilliard's blog, he's actually something relatively recent in the last year where he did a, um, uh, startup measurements for all the combinations of CDS enabled, CDS disabled, AOT enabled, CDS and AOT. So well worth actually just seeing some of the experiments that he's been doing there. Yeah, we're, we're, in general, we're working better in cloud environments is, is one of our, one of our, our big themes. A uh, question from Twitter, um, Alan can probably answer this. Uh, what is the main difference between Kotlin coroutines and Java fibers? What Kotlin, what Kotlin calls a coroutine is very similar, I think, to the, uh, to the concept of, uh, of fibers that, that we're working on in, in Project Loom. So I think they're somewhat similar. I think they've experimented quite a bit in, 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 in a couple areas that are also areas that we will also be exploring. So I think there's quite a lot of commonality there. But there are some distinct differences. The big distinct difference is, 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 is that we're actually building this support into the VM. Um, we're not doing a byte weaving in state table type of solution. Um, you also don't have to explicitly mark every one of the methods that are suspendable. Um, we're actually going all the way into the library so that any of the blocking points where threads would block today in system calls or block waiting or parking the thread waiting for locks they will actually park the, uh, the fibers, which will freeze up the thread to do something else. So f we're probably going at a much lower level than this because it's providing the support in the runtime. Yeah, and, and that, that, that's really a key difference in, in a system like, like Kotlin, and you see this in JavaScript as well, you, you always have to remember, well, is this thing, is this async calling sync or sync calling async, and there are all these rules you have to, have to follow. With fibers in Java, that it'll just be completely transparent. You know, they're just like threads, but way lighter weight. Okay. Good morning. Hello. Um, uh, everybody nowadays uh, likes immutability. The, we all know the benefits about it. And um, uh, I heard uh, Stuart talk about uh, the vol or the let uh, keyword mm -hmm. and that it was very difficult to, uh, to implement it or I don't know. But uh, is there any chance that uh, this will ever come into the Java language because uh, all the most of the programmers don't really like the final word. It uh, makes the the code uh, yeah, go uh, all directions. And for me, it would really uh, help me if uh, something like a vol would also be in uh, Java. So, so just a quick clarification. I, I didn't think I said that it was difficult to implement. It was a design decision not to implement um, let or val alongside a var. And Actually, I think we had some prototype oh. at some point with some yeah. with both keywords. I think <coughs> one of the main reasons we dropped Val is that in modern program in modern Java, uh, the compiler will figure out the, where the final goes for you most of the time. So we have effectively final since JDK eight, yeah. which was introduced in order mostly to help Lambda programming. And with this, basically, a lot of the final keywords in local variable declaration are redundant. So we felt that it wasn't, there wasn't a lot of need for this uh, new keyword. Ryan? Yeah, no, that, 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 that's fair. I mean, that, that um, any place where finality is required, the compiler can infer that for you. And so this was a design choice of uh, having a simpler model. Um, you know, some people agree, some people disagree. It's really a matter of personal preference. We, we chose it one way. If we had chosen the other way, you could very well have stood up and said, how come you added two new keywords? Um, and, you know, you have to make a choice. Yeah. We, we made a choice uh, in this oh. same direction, basically, that C-sharp made. Yeah, we actually made that choice in, in, in part based on, on survey data, where you know, e even more people would have asked, why did you, ask, why did you add two keywords instead of one? 
And you know, we don't, we don't, we're, we certainly aren't driven entirely by survey data, but it is indicative of how how people will respond when we get a lot of responses. All right, a uh, question from Twitter. Uh, this one, I'll, I, I, in most cases, I, w I won't identify the author, but in this case, I can't resist saying, this is from DevOps Trump. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not a bad question. <laughs> what is the difference between incubator and preview features? Can I use them in production? That is an excellent question. That is an excellent question. Maybe <laughs> Dr. Deprecator would like to take that? Really? <laughs> Okay. It's well, like the inverse of deprecation. So yeah, it sort must of. Be up your alley. Um, maybe. So uh, let's see. So incubator. So so I think the short answer for can you use them in production? Answer no. Uh, well, you, you can, but well, it might be unwise. You should shouldn't. There, there's <laughs> you're, a whole you're taking more risk, and there's a whole aware. space of things that you shouldn't do, but people do anyway. Uh, so so incubation applies to modules, and a preview feature is something that is more closely tied in with the language and the libraries. Um, I don't know how much more detail can go in there. Is there? Well, and and, and um, th th there, there's kind of an assumption that preview features are something that are really. They're finished, but we're waiting for a round of feedback just to make sure that the color of paint is is exactly right yeah. before uh, before finalizing it. Whereas the um, you know the the incubator mechanism is you know admits more room for we're going to iterate on this API several times, but we're you know we want to put it out there to get uh, primarily to get feedback. I think I think that what's common between them is that both need to be enabled with explicit command line options. Right. And there's a warning that says you have enabled use of an incubator module or you have enabled uh, use of a preview feature. And the warning is there to say if you start to depend on this, then it's possible or even likely that there will be incompatible changes made to these in the future. Use at your own risk. Yes. Question from Twitter, why are there already over 600 Java modules uploaded to Maven Central with invalid module names? Well, that's, I guess people are, are they're, they're well-meaning, but they need to learn just a bit more. The question goes on, is no automatic module name better than an invalid one? Uh, certainly, yes. So, <laughs> that, uh, so it, it, as, as you might recall, with, with Java modules, if you don't want to do the full modularization of, of a jar, you can at least claim its name as an automatic module for, for what, whatever time in the future uh, you, you do do a full modularization. Uh, apparently, according to this reporter, some people are, uh, are using invalid names. Uh, you know, please don't do that. Please, please use proper uh, reverse DNS names. Um, that, that is the best advice we have. More questions in the room? Down here? So we have one in the top center here. Oh, oh. okay. Yeah, yeah he was first, I think. Uh, Whatever. Just a quick one. Uh, will, when will the support for automatic modules be removed? When will we go like full modules? When will the support for automatic uh, the support for automatic modules will probably never be removed. Uh, I, it's it's it, it's there, it's there as a as a migration mechanism. Right. Uh, we, we hope that people will, will use it as the first step towards full modularization, but we understand full well it's, it's going to be years before the ecosystem as a whole, or at least the active part of the ecosystem, migrates to modules, and that's okay. So we, you know, we've designed for that, so that's why, that's why automatic modules exist. You know, the hope is in, I don't know what, five, ten years from now, uh, at least the components in Central that are actively maintained will have modularized, and there won't be many automatic modules around, but it's certainly possible that you know uh, libraries that are that are just barely maintained they might not get around to it for for another twelve years. Who knows? So I, I doubt we will ever remove that mechanism. Uh, good morning. Currently, Java tries to reuse uh, main uh, CPU and uh, use all the power that it uh, gives the system. But uh, uh, there was an uh, initiative uh, several years ago that Java go beyond the CPU and try to use uh, GPU as well. Are there any plans to continue in this direction? I, I understand that there was a cooperative with uh, IMD and uh, there's a... Uh, through the party support from the library could are you going to follow in this direction so, 
So, so the project you're referring to was Project Sumatra, which was a uh, cooperation uh, largely between Oracle and AMD, as you point out. That project fizzled out, and that's fine, because projects like that are experiments, and a lot was learned about uh, you know, the practicality of that. Uh, so that project is no longer active, but there is an active project to engage vector support. Uh, so most, uh, most modern CPUs have uh, vector instructions. Uh, Intel and AMD both have their own vector instruction sets. So as part of Project Panama, there is a vector API being grown now that allows you to um, express vectorization, vector-ready computations, and have it compiled down to vector instructions. So some of the things that we learned in Project Sumatra have been applied to the vector API, um, and that's something that you, know, you should be able to use you know, sometime like uh, you know, in the next few versions. So clarification on the vector API. Now, is there a JEP for that? Or, uh, I, I, I think there's, there, there is a JEP that is currently in draft state for okay. it. Well, so it's confusing because people talk about vectors. This has nothing to do with java.util.vector. It's really, <laughs> right? Uh, but at first glance, I think it could be very confusing. So this, this, this vector API, if you look at... Um, uh, recent conference talks. I think at Code One there was a talk on the vector API. Was both on this. Oh, Sam. Okay. Yeah. So, Dr. Deprecator. Yes. When will we deprecate the vector? <laughs> the, the old vector API. Ah, that's or a, have we already? That's I a, forgot. That's an excellent question. No, it's not been deprecated yet. Uh, yeah. So there are. Uh, there's the possibility of deprecating um, what we call the legacy collections, uh, in particular vector and hash table. Um, we haven't really done so far just because it generates a lot of warnings and um, it's a lot of work to suppress those warnings. One of the problems is that there's still a lot of APIs out there that use vector in things like method, method signatures and we cannot change those without um, breaking binary compatibility, which we don't want to do. Um, nonetheless, so those generate unavoidable warnings. So I think there's a lot of inertia, at least within the JDK. Um, how many people use hash table? Nobody. A oh, few no. people. Okay. A few yeah. embarrassed hands going. Yeah, a few embarrassed hands. Most people should be using hash map now. How many, so how many people use... You didn't pronounce it correctly. Hashtable. Hashtable. <laughs> hashtable. <laughs> well, I was afraid that if I said hashtable, then... I would have elbowed you. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and how many people use Java Util Vector? Not very many at all. Okay, so that's a... One? Okay. That's a... That's a, that's a good data point. Um, so I don't know. I think that, that in part of the problem there is that the JDK uses those a lot internally. And so that, that's, that's a lot of work for um, potentially not that much gain. But, um, and, and a lot of the legacy uh, you know, frameworks, uh, you know, WebSphere and WebLogic, yeah, that's you know, use it pretty heavily. And so yeah, if, if we started deprecating those, we would get howls of complaint from 20-year-old code bases saying, this has been working for 20 years. Why are you making trouble for us? Yeah. So, so they might be deprecated in the ordinary sense, which is a recommendation not to use them, but I do not think that we will ever actually remove them because that would cause old binaries to stop working and there's no value uh, I can see that, that, that there is actually removing those. There's somebody down here had a question, Sven? Come on, make him work for it. <laughs> Hello. Uh, there was an interesting talk yesterday about about GraalVM. Uh, I would like to know if you have any plan to to re, uh, to replace Hotspot with GraalVM in the future. Funny you should ask that question. So so the the short answer answer is no, uh, because Graal, So because and this terminology is confusing. So bear with me. I'll try try to explain it. So so GraalVM is is is, 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 a, is a product that can run Java and a bunch of other languages. Uh, it's built on top of, well, JDK 8 at the moment. It includes a, compi a runtime compiler, which is called Graal, not GraalVM. It also includes a front-end framework called Truffle, which is how they've implemented all the other languages aside from Java. And so all that's really, really cool. It can, it can run all these languages together and do you know, cross-language optimizations and stuff like that. So, so GraalVM is, the, is that biggest thing. Then there's, there's that, that Graal runtime compiler. And indeed, we do have a project that's been running for a while now called Metropolis. Uh, and the goal there is e eventually to replace the Hotspot C2 runtime compiler with the Graal compiler, not GraalVM 
but the Graal compiler. Um, we, that, that, the Graal compiler has been uh, in the JDK now for, uh, you know, since JDK 9 as, as experimental. Uh, so you can actually enable it today. If you if you, you you download 11, you can you can en enable it with a couple of, of command line flags, and boom, you're using the Graal compiler instead of C1 or C2. Um, you might get in, in some cases you could see better peak performance, uh, but you'll you'll you will quickly run up against uh, you know one of one of the tough problems that we need to solve before we we replace the C2 with Graal, which is that well Graal is written in Java, which is really cool, makes it easier to maintain, but since it's written in Java, it it kind of has to compile itself before the compiler itself gets really fast. Um, so it'll event eventually eventually it can get to good peak performance, but it takes a while. And you know the ultimate solution to that problem will involve you know deep ahead of time compilation and such, but we're we're just not there yet. But we're headed there. With uh, containerization becoming more popular, uh, knowing exactly how much memory a JVM is going to require has become a, a bigger concern. And while you can specify Metaspace and Heap. There's more to the JVM than that. Is there any work being done on making it more predictable how much total memory the JVM might need? Well, it's really tricky. If you take, for example, a garbage collector like G1, which happens to be the default collector, um, it's very hard for the user to know how much memory you will be using in total because the size of the remembered sets uh, depends on how many cross-regional references you're, you're storing with your, with your stores. How are we meant to know that? Well, you're not. So I, I guess the simple answer is that it comes down a bit to trial and error, and we can't really guarantee much. Um, but having said that, there are other aspects to it as well, um, like the maximum amount of memory use throughout your application might not always be the best configuration for um, most of the time during execution time. So what we'd like to do better, I suppose, is find ways of giving that memory to the operating system so that you can overcommit memory and um, have you know, n not hog all the memory all the time, but give it back and be a little bit more flexible. Um, but it's it's a tricky thing for us to figure out automatically automatically how much memory are we allowed to use without user input. But yeah, there are a bunch of ideas, and we we are looking into it. And yeah, I hope it will get better. But complete predictability. I don't think it's possible. Yeah, just to, just to, just to add to what Eric said, there is is at least for the Java Heap part of things. I I I I I assume most people know that there's been a lot of work done in the last couple of releases to actually to make the 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 runtime work better in in uh, containerized and Docker environments. It's picking up the 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 memory size correctly now rather than picking up the the memory and, and, and resources on number of cores and things on the physical machine is actually picking them up correctly for the for the Docker environment. So things work a lot better with JDK eleven. I think some of those changes went into eight one of the eight updates as well. So so I realize that's not answering all of Ian's question, but definitely the Java runtime works a lot better in uh, in, in, in container environments in the last couple of releases. Yeah. And with tools like AOT and class data sharing, you can also get more predictability because uh, you're pre-compiling a lot more of your image into a shared library that can just be paged in and shared more effectively across, um, you know, across Docker uh, containers. Uh, so you know, th there are a bunch of tools that you can use if you're willing to do the extra work of AOTing or um, CDSing your application. You're uh, removing a, a lot of the uncertainty in addition to uh, increasing the amount of shareability between, uh, between containers. The question from Twitter, this is not from DevOps Trump. But the questioner asks, how do we make Java great again? To many university students, Java seems to be like COBOL, not something the cool kids would touch with a stick. Does that mean we're not cool? <laughs> I thought we were cool. Bunch of old buddy duddies, I suppose. 
so, so you know, the, the, the challenge for evolving the platform is, of course, um, you know, you, you want to evolve, you want to keep, uh, keep the language vibrant, you want to incorporate ideas that are, you know, are, are, are relevant, but as Venkat said on, uh, in his opening keynote, uh, developers aren't really ready to accept changes in large increments, and so you have to make changes in smaller increments. Um, and so that's exactly what we're doing. Uh, you know, there are a number of, of changes you know, that have gone into Java in the last you know, um, 10, 20 years, and a number of changes that will go in in the next 10, 20 years. Um, and the rate of change may look small, but if you look at Java code today compared to what Java code looked like five to 10 years ago, it's a pretty big difference. Um, you know, ten, 10 years ago, we had just added generics. Most, uh, most libraries were not generified yet, so you had code filled with ugly casts, and, and you had no lambdas and enormous interclasses. And you look at Java code today, it's a big, big difference. But it's easy to not recognize the, you know, the, uh, the amount of change because it's coming in relatively small, uh, small increments. And we plan to keep doing that. So, uh, you know, the, the, their, you know the, the, the pipeline for language features is, you know, with, uh, we, we have more, more to do than, we, than, than we're, than we're going to be able to. There's a lot of really cool stuff coming. Um, so I, I, I guess the cool kids get to decide what they want to use, but uh, I, I think there's a lot of cool stuff coming. So um, I don't know about cool, but I think there have been some uh, qualitative uh, changes made to the way that you can uh, write and execute Java programs in the past uh, couple of releases. Um, two in particular are the introduction of JShell, and the other is the um, single file, um, single file, source yeah, source launcher. Uh, and so those are just introduced. Um, J shell is really nice. Um, I use it all the time. You can, it's it's a Java shell. You can fire it up and start typing Java statements and expressions. You don't have to write a class. You don't have to write public static void public main. Static void main. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so that's really nice. Uh, even as an advanced or, or perhaps expert user, I use that all the time. Um, our hope is that uh, beginning users or people coming from other languages can use it for exploratory programming. Uh, that's, the, that's the reason that you have things like you know, read eval print loops. Uh, and then the single uh, the source launcher it enables you to write a, a, a .java file uh, in, in one, well, a you know, regular class in a .java file and then execute it directly from the Java launcher, avoiding the step of running Java C and then Java with the right class path and so forth. Uh, and so I think that's a little step forward and people are exploring that to see how they can use that. And I think that adds a lot of flexibility and it also reduces the, the overhead to get started with things. And, and the, the common theme, both of those, is what we call activation energy, right? Where, you know, one, 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 you know, one of the big complaints about Java is that to do something small, you have to do a lot of setup, and you know, and that's true, and that's reflected in the philosophy that Java was as a language designed for doing bigger things, but it makes doing smaller things have more overhead. And so, the um, the interactive shell, the single file launcher, are both. Uh, activation energy plays to make it easier for people to get up and running with simple things, and we have a lot of things in the pipeline that are in the same category. So it, you know, should continue to get better. Yeah, including an idea for getting rid of public static void. Maybe. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> we might do that. That would be very appealing. Ooh. Hello, and, and and that's mostly an impediment to like people learning the language, right? That that you imagine what it's like on your first day of class having public static void main explained to you. It's it's uh, that's a lot to get over before you can write hello world. Yeah. Okay, so why are you sitting here instead of coding the Valhalla project, making it finally available for everyone? <laughs> we all can't wait. <laughs> yeah, get, get back to work. Okay, it's, all we're right, done. Let's go. <laughs> We were actually fields. talking about that at breakfast. We were uh, at, at breakfast. We were talking about a, a difficult problem in Valhalla. So we can do two things at once. Almost. Anyone else? Back to Twitter. Uh, da, da, da. Are there any secret projects you can't talk about? Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> <yeah. laughs> I mean, a, a, actually, we, we we try to be very transparent. There's not much secrets. Up, up there? Yes, sir. Okay. Hi, good morning. The project Loom says that we'll have continuations, but normally this goes against the final blocks. So how are you planning to make them work together? Is this working? Yep. It turned itself off. Sorry, I, I'm not sure what your problem with finally blocks is. So if, if you have a continuation that's running a task that has finally blocks, then they, when the execution gets 
the, the once the block gets uh, you know, terminates gracefully or ungracefully, that final block will actually exit, or sorry, will actually execute. Uh, maybe so if if I capture continuation within a try block, then the finally would execute. Oh, okay. I think, I think I know what you're, what you're, what, what you're, are you actually, are you creating it in the try block? Yeah, I'm catching the continuation within the try block. Okay, I'm not sure what you mean by catching. Can you come up afterwards and I'll, and we'll go to an example? Because yeah, I'm not sure what you mean by catching it. Yeah, he wants to suspend a, uh, a computation from inside, inside a try block. Hi again. Um, we, uh, there was a question about collections, and, and I was wondering, were you just hinting about a new collection API? And if so, then uh, if you, since you don't want to remove vector and stuff like that, would it not be possible to put it in a, in a separate external module so that the web spheres can still include it, but that we don't, uh, we don't have it anymore? Well, I don't think I was hinting in a new collections API. Uh, the, the, the difficulty is that, that vector and hashtable are in java.util, and you can't take individual, individual classes and put them into a separate package. So that mechanism won't really work. And it's really not the size of those. I mean, they're not terribly large classes. Um, and so again, I don't actually think we're going to remove those. Um, now, as for collections futures, I think that there's, there's no concrete roadmap. I think when Valhalla comes along, that will potentially cause a complete rethink of how data structures are, are uh, represented in Java. And so, but what that will look like, I don't know. So I have a question about um, serialization. Uh, so putting aside what happened 20 years ago. It's okay, ago, Brian. <laughs> putting, putting aside a, a diatribe about what happened many years ago, what is the current thinking about what the role of serialization should be in the, the core libraries and the support in the VM? Because there's been enormous amount of experimentation and serialization uh, libraries uh, um, in the wider community. And I'm wondering, is it, wh what are you thinking about this right now? So, so from, from my perspective, w one of the many problems with serialization is that it attempts to be able to serialize an arbitrary object graph. Um, and I, I think this is promising too much. And as a result, it has to resort to some pretty awful tricks um, that make it almost impossible to reason about the state of objects. And so uh, the way that I would uh, look at this is to say, what is serialization for? Well, what I want serialization for is for serializing data so that I can exchange my data between programs. And that's a simpler problem, and that's a problem that we can solve. And so my intention there is to define a mechanism by which a class can, uh, we can raise serialization into the programming, into the object model proper, where you can say, I'm a serializable class, and here's my serialized form. Um, and here's the process by which you reduce an instance of this class to a, uh, a simplified representation, which is the serialized form, and have that surfaced in the programming model itself. And the, the big problem, one of the many big problems of serialization. Amongst? Amongst the problems of serialization uh, is that it's invisible, it's magic, it's behind your back, and you always forget. And so you can read the code and think you know what's going on in your code, but you don't because the runtime is injecting this, uh, this additional behavior into your class. And so merely by saying serialization is for exchanging data between VMs and raising the serialization process into the object model, you can render it uh, more reliable, uh, more scrutable, um, you know, uh, easier to reason about. The cost is uh, for lower level things like I've got a graph of objects that includes references to things like open sockets and such. We leave that behind to legacy serialization and, and then it becomes a much easier problem. So I think uh, the, 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 the big um, the big move there is being more explicit about what serialization is for, and then looking at how the object model can support people writing classes that are safely serializable. And uh, we have, uh, we're, we're, we're working on that. So I wanted to add a few words about uh, what Brian just referred to as legacy serialization, or Java legacy serialization, which I think is a, a, a more descriptive term for what, you know, the, the usual java.io.serializable and object output stream stuff. And I think that's useful to distinguish it from other ideas. Um, but that hasn't stood still. And so I think several of us on this panel have complained and say we should get rid of it. But in fact, it's 
completely impractical to get rid of it because it is, it is well used. Or I should say it's used a lot. It might not be well used. Um, uh, but the fact is, people use it. Uh, and uh, so we have continued to evolve it, um, in mainly not to enhance capabilities, but rather to prevent errors. And so we've added a f serialization filtering mechanism, which allows you to blacklist or whitelist types that uh, are serializable, uh, that can be deserialized. There is also a, uh, some work going on to, if you're familiar with the API, there are some magic methods that are called reflectively. And if you spell those method names wrong, there's no warning or anything. They just, your program simply doesn't work properly. And so we are uh, adding some, um, uh, some warnings checking to say, okay, if you're intending to implement one of those magic serialization methods, then you have to get everything exactly right, and the system will attempt to warn you if you uh, make a mistake in doing that. So there's still activity going on there trying to, to make things in the legacy serialization area a little bit more robust. I can, okay. Um, I saw the presentation on Project Loom on Wednesday, and I was wondering if fibers are meant to supplant threads uh, eventually in the Java language, or are they meant to be in addition? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think TBD, would, it, but it would be nice in, it, to come back in a couple of years' time and, uh, and, and uh, look at libraries out there that have no knowledge of Java Lang thread as they do today. Especially around things like thread locals and some of the uh, the misuses of of, of uh, thread locals today, I think it would be nice to come back in a few years' time and not see any of those in modern libraries. But but the, is, I I think the the ideal future is that uh, thread and thread local are still around, but they are rarely used. Uh, so you know you need a mechanism for uh, interacting with operating system threads. But currently, because it's the only mechanism we have for describing asynchronous streams of computation, it gets used for a lot of things that would be uh, a better application for fibers. Um, and similarly, with thread locals, we use thread locals to simulate processor locals, scope locals, thread locals, caches, all of these things. Um, it would be nice to see um, the proper mechanism being used for those. And, and, and when things re-equilibrate in you know, five or 10 years, I think what you will see is most code is using fibers and fiber locals or whatever we're going to call that, um, and that the code that uses threads and thread locals are things like the thread pool implementation in the, in the JDK that, uh, that you mount fibers on top of. So uh, hopefully we will get to the point where many, many people, many, many fewer people are using threads directly. But if you really need to, you can. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think we'll deprecate them. Nope. A uh, quick question from Twitter. From, from, yeah, sorry, doctor. Quick question from Twitter that I'd, I'd like to answer. Will the Oracle JDK have optimizations that will not be available in Open JDK after Java 11? No. That would that would ruin the, the entire value proposition, right? The whole idea is you have a choice to make. You can take the blue pill. You can take the red pill. You can choose between a, a JDK from Oracle. You can you can get a JDK, JDK builds from a variety of other pr providers. Uh, and you can you can switch between one and the other. If we start putting proprietary features, if any of those providers start putting in proprietary features, then that becomes a lock-in problem and makes the platform as a whole less attractive to the ecosystem as a whole, which is you know, less good for everyone. Uh, you need a mic. He, he, he has a mic, so he gets to go first. Thank you. Hello again. Uh, current uh, profiling in Java, it's a uh, rise to choose between combination of native thing uh, or standard profile or tool that uh, build from the IP that is not uh, completely open. Are you going to introduce another more documented or more not usable but uh, the IP uh, tool that can be um, uh, declared that is the way to do it? I mean that uh, I'm talking about uh, using Perf and Linux uh, and enable several uh, flags in order to GVA give the, the information about what they're doing and another uh, appropriate API in you know, uh, OpenGDK. Um, I forgot the, um, the class name, but it gives you ability to solve the problem with a safe point uh, that is declared uh, only in the method uh, in and out and in the for loop. So you can better understand in what actually uh, code burns your TPU without, in this case. Um, so I think 
the best way of doing profiling in Java is using the flight recorder, which is open source. And yeah, it is freely available, and I would say that is probably the way to do it. And yeah, if you haven't tried it, you should you should try it. It's great. And, and, and um, you know, to draw a distinction uh, between, you know, how, how we choose what to invest in, right? There is a rich ecosystem of profiling tools out there, some free, some commercial, and we think that's great, right? And so we don't see the need for the JDK to try to compete with the profiler that comes with your IDE or some of the commercial tools that are out there. What we focus on is making sure that the hooks into the JVM are there so that anybody can hook in and get that data. So there are a number of APIs, the debugging API, the JVMTI API flight recorder that make various uh, information available from a running JVM that tools can then collect and present to users. And our focus is on making sure that those APIs are as good as they can be. And as Eric said, you know, uh, JFR is relatively new. It's very powerful. Uh, you know, I, I, and I think it, 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 um, it offers a lot more information than a lot of the older APIs do. It may take some time for the tools in the ecosystem to catch up to start using it, but you know, that will come for sure. Yeah. I suspect the question may have actually, were you actually specifically asking about async call trace? Yes, I'm asking about are the tools available, are the tools available, are you going to support this API, the precise information that this API gives the user going to use another one? Okay, so you're not on the microphone, so only picking up half of what you said there. If you are, bring are we going to support it, or are we going to do another one? Okay, so a, a, async call trace is inherently unsupportable because it's actually scanning the thread stack at, 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 at uh, completely arbitrary times. Um, anything using it today is, has to do all sorts of hacks and retries and things like that. Um, so it, it's something to bring up on the serviceability dev list. It's been brought up, sorry, it's an open JDK uh, uh, mailing list. It's been discussed several times. Um, but, um, I haven't seen anything on the discussions recently that would suggest that moving that to, to JVMTI or any other supported interface because it's inherently unreliable. Yeah, my question probably not so technical, but uh, the question, like we faced a problem um, in, with my colleague. He found a bug. He created a question on Stack Overflow just to make sure that it is a, really a bug, but then the challenge was to find out where exactly to report the bug. And after we found it, he created the issue on that like system. Then that issue was copied to some other internal Jira uh, tracker, and then discussion continued like in read-only mode. So we couldn't just uh, comment there. People were writing, probably some internal people. Why um, entrance threshold is so high? Why you don't make it more simple and uh, easy to contribute to the language specification, even in the code level or maybe even on the issue uh, reporting level? So th please thank your colleague for fi filing the bug report. Uh, I'm sorry it was difficult to find the place to submit them. That's bugreport.java.com. Um, yes, we do, we do have a, a team that triages those reports uh, because there is an un unbelievable amount of noise. Um, and so th things go, go through a triage process, probably 80% of, of the reports are, are thrown away because they're, they're useless. Uh, and the rest of them ultimately make it into the OpenJDK, uh, but the, the OpenJDK bug system, which is, which is a JIRA instance, uh, where unless something is related to a security vulnerability, it is by default public. Now, it, it, it is true that right now, uh, it, it, it's not the case that arbitrary people can just come and comment on reports there. Uh, that's due to, uh, due to a, a number, number of limitations, uh, some technical, some having to do with licensing. Uh, we may open that up in, in, in the future. Um, we, d we do... Uh, offer to people who have who have submitted uh, you know good quality bug, a number of good quality bug reports we do offer them access to that jira so that they can continue to do so uh, and also comment on 
existing issues. So with, we, within the limitations that we currently have, we, you know, we're, 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 we're trying, to, we're trying to, to, to be inclusive, um, but there, there are certain limits on how many people we can accept into that JIRA. Uh, but in the meantime, the mailing lists are completely open. You can sign up for any OpenJDK mailing list and discuss, discuss an issue there. Uh, and if you do raise you know, relevant uh, questions or comments or suggestions or even patches, uh, then chances are someone who does have access to the JIRA will make sure that those are eventually uh, tracked into the appropriate issue. Yeah, in, in particular, if you have significant information that you think would add to the bug report, but you don't have uh, bug database access, then, then writing to the mailing list to say, you know, I, I was looking at this bug report, and here is, here's a way, re way, a way to reproduce it, or something like that. Yeah, that or here's a workaround, or something yeah. like that. But, but, but I, I, I think, I think um, what people often don't realize when, when they ask this question, because this is a question we get a lot, is you just have no idea the scale of bug reports you're talking about. Um, the, I, I think the conversion rate from uh, the front end web bugs to the internal system is actually much lower than the 20%. It's, it's, I, I was trying to be generous. Yeah, I think it's like 98% that get filtered out as either n being worthless issues, uh, not clearly stated, non-reproducible, not appropriate, etc. cetera. Yeah, and, another OpenGL crash in Minecraft. And <laughs> there are, you know, um, Oracle employs multiple full-time people just to screen these bugs, right? The cost is substantial. And so it's very easy to see the benefit to an individual developer to say, well, why can't I submit a bug report? It's hard to imagine what the cost of that is at the scale of 12 million developers and what the impact would be on the rate at which the JDK could move forward, right? So uh, while it may be satisfying for every developer to be able to submit every bug report that they have in mind, the cost to the community would be substantial and you probably wouldn't like the outcome. And so the system is the way it is for a reason, even though it's a little bit inconvenient. Yeah, and uh, to, to, to refer to an ear earlier question from this gentleman over here, uh, what would you rather have us do? Would you ra rather, rather us all be working on, on Amber, Loom, Panama, and, and Valhalla, or would you rather us filtering, <laughs> filtering bugs? Um, you might not like the answer. He might want his OpenGL crash to Minecraft works for him. <laughs> <laughs> that may be. All right, we've got uh, three minutes left, according to the clock. Any, anyone okay, have a Okay, speaking of Java Util Vector, what about state of swing? Is swing really uh, going to die? I, 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 I don't believe there are any current current plans to kill swing. I think you know swing is a, is, is swing AWT and two D graphics are are all pretty mature technologies. Um, you know we, we we do continue to, uh, to to fix bugs in them. There's the occasional enhancement. A couple of releases ago, we added support for for high DPI displays. Um, but you know, I think the, the future really is with frameworks like JavaFX. There are no plans to deprecate Swing. No. Uh, it, they are, it is no. not deprecated, and there are no plans at present. Right, that's Stuart speaking. If Dr. Deprecator were speaking. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Two and a half minutes remaining. Hello. Hello. Um, with Gemini, there was a feature uh, ship that it was the um, uh, module layer. I'm not sure I understood I, how I can exploit this feature, so I was wondering if you can give a, a practical example or a use case where a Java developer can use this feature. Pra practical use cases use JDK 9 or newer and use JLink to create a runtime that just has the modules that you actually require. That is actually a really compelling use case. Um, so um, he was Sorry, asking I, about the layer API, talking about layers. Mo module layers. Oh, module layer. Okay, Mo module layer. So um, anything anything that's doing um, plugins or any kind of dynamics or plugins can use the module layer very very effectively. Um, you you can also anyone that's doing container type applications, even server type containers, if if they think about that um, for a few minutes, they'll actually figure out that they can actually do this in really really nice nice way with module layers, creating a module layer for each application. And works really, really well because you can just instantiate it when the when that application starts in quotes, and um, it, it 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 will be able to then um, uh, um, ensure that any of the any of the modules that that application needs are actually there, are there. They're resolved. That the access and everything is set up correctly, and that they're linked to the um, all of the the modules and that are in in the uh, in in the boot layer. So it works really, really well for dynamic type environments like that. 
All right, I think our, our time is just about up. Thank you very much for coming and for your questions, both here and on Twitter. Uh, one of the last questions is, you know, what, what do I do if I still have a question and I wasn't able to ask it? Uh, feel free to tweet with this hashtag, well, the hashtag that used to be here, uh, and insofar as, as, as we have time in the next, uh, next couple of days, we will attempt to answer them you know, insofar as the bandwidth of, of Twitter allows. When we're not working on Valhalla. When we're not working on Valhalla, or Panama, or Amber, or Loom, or fixing Minecraft OpenGL crashes. Thank you very much.